so in this uh, group of people, I think I don't have to talk um, too much about the usefulness of open science in general. But I can say a few words maybe uh, first about the motivation behind having a dashboard on open science. And the mission statement of our Quest Center, whose data scientist I am, is to promote open and responsible research. And this is also very much in line with the strategic document that the Charité uh, Hospital, University Hospital, released uh, a few years ago. It's a strategy document uh, that delineates what the future of the institution should look like by the year 2030. And uh, again, very much in line with this, the robustness and reproducibility of the scientific research in the biomedical field uh, is at the forefront and therefore the promotion of open and responsible research. And in order to know how to intervene and improve um, this status, we need to know where we currently stand in terms of um, the research and publication practices um, at our institution. And I would also add, we need to know where we are going or how things have been developing. And therefore, the dashboard that we've developed is simply a monitoring tool that showcases the progress of the different um, metrics over time. Which metrics uh, have we focused on? Originally, the approach uh, was to focus on what was feasible, uh, to focus on metrics that reflect the fairness and robustness of the uh, content. Recently, at the beginning of this year, uh, a bunch of uh, meta researchers were um, brought together uh, in this um, project community consensus was um, achieved during which the core practices um, of open science that deserve to be monitor monitored um, have been established. And um, for us, it is interesting, this is a list of the final uh, 19 practices uh, split into traditional open science practices, the first 12, and then into broader transparency practices. And um, of course, since um, collaborators uh, at our institution were involved in this process, we see that um, many of these practices are already reflected in our own dashboard, as um, can be seen with the check marks on this side. In addition to these, we have um, a sub dashboard that focuses exclusively on the fairness of the data and data reusability. I'm going to very briefly uh, show you this during the demonstration and feel free to ask questions if you uh, have them on this part. We've also uh, have a subsection of the dashboard that focuses on visualizations, which are not uh, reflected in this consensus building um, list. Now, an important uh, thing that you notice is that not everything has a check mark. And some check marks are slightly lightly, um, yeah, lighter in color. And the reason is that not everything is currently feasible. And the dashboard is not, you know, something that you can make about any metric that you can think of. But um, for some of the metrics, no currently, yeah, feasible method exists or they're being in the, uh, developed. But um, yeah, there are uh, constraints about what you can show on the dashboard. At this point, I'm going to quickly, um, to well, br briefly end the slideshow mode and then show you the actual dashboard. So this is where the landing page of the dashboard itself. As you can see, it has several um, panels with different images um, that reflect the different metrics. Um, of course, it comes with a nice introduction. And then here's probably what you're mostly interested in, the Open Science tab. Um, we can, for example, zoom in here at the Open Data um, panel that shows the percentage of publications um, from the Charité over the years that um, includes um, so-called open data. That means sharing 
of data that is openly accessible in the paper. And this is as proportion to the total um, articles that we've screened, uh, split by the type of repository where the data have been uploaded. So disciplinary in general, combined a general purpose um, disciplinary uh, repositories, as well as restricted data that we also uh, monitor. Um, for most of these practices, such as open access, open data, or open code, you can see that through the years, there's an increase uh, in the practice, which is, of course, something we would like to see. Um, still, it is the case that for open data, and especially for open code, um, publications that have this feature are exceedingly rare. Um, but, you know, from in the last few years, the numbers have gone up, but they're still quite low. Of course, not every publication produces code to share, and this is um, shown as proportion of the total number of publications. So we don't expect these numbers to really uh, reach 100%, but um, it's good to know how they are how they're developing over time. What um, I also promised to show you was just uh, very briefly the FAIR data, which is based on the um, data shared um, that I just um, showed in the other tab. This is split by the fairness criteria, the findability. Um, um, yeah, if, if you if you're, uh, want to, to know more about the, the fair criteria here, the links, it's, it's um, about whether the data that are shared are um, shared in a useful way. Um, most broadly speaking, again, split by fields, um, disciplinary versus general purpose repositories, the different repositories uh, are shown here. And I'm not uh, going to spend more time on this because we are pressed for time. If we have more questions, we can return to this um, at the end. Now, going back to the presentation. Yes. The data that you've seen um, comes from a variety of sources. Most importantly, the central um, source of information that we have is the publication record of our scientists at the Charité. And this was um, provided kindly by the Charité Medical Library. And then on top of this, we've used um, many different sources of uh, metadata information, such as uh, open Alex, dimensions, unpaywall, wall, et cetera, et cetera, depending on the different um, panels and the different practices shown on the dashboard. Um, of course, we use um, a subset of these sources. The way that data are processed um, in a very brief um, overview is that we plan and um, to update the dashboard yearly. We are actually currently in the uh, updating process for the this year cycle. Of course, we're looking at the publications uh, a year behind. Um, so we will be updating the dashboard now for the year 2022. And um, a lot of the data processing is automated and it potentially is fully automatable. But in practice, a lot of manual uh, validation is necessary. And the data quality varies. Um, and for certain practices, for other reasons, we need to ensure, for example, that the open data um, are not um, false positive cases because we want to incentivize um, through a different, um, yeah, for different reasons, we, we want to incentivize the authors that are institutions that actually have produced uh, publications with open data. And for that, manual validation of these cases is added on top of the um, automated screening. The important resources for this whole process are, of course, as I said, the publication record, ideally provided by um, the library that you work with. You can, of course, produce such a record yourself, but it's not a trivial um, process, as I'm sure many of you already know. Um, then another limiting factor is the actual access to the full text um, of the publications in um, the format of PDFs. 
this varies um, depending on institutional access, but it is an important step in the um, analysis process because for many of the automated screening tools that we use, such as OTPUB and uh, Contribot, et cetera, this is the starting point um, for the analysis. And finally, um, yeah, the outlook uh, for the uh, dashboard. I would say that um, the fact that we have a publicly available dashboard um, is something that shows what kind of uh, practices our institution values. And um, therefore, this is promoting um, the open science practices just by simply um, displaying them on the dashboard. Further, we want to inc uh, increase the number of practices that we monitor. Um, more specifically, we are in the process of adding an author contribution statement uh, panel that monitors the proportion of articles that have an author contribution statement. Potentially later, this will be um, adjusted to reflect the proportion of author contribution statements that follow the uh, credit taxonomy. And uh, we are also in the process of in, uh, including another panel that includes the av availability of data availability statements and code availability statements in the articles as a um, practice that um, a tr transparency that, that demonstrates transparency of reporting. We have collaborations with other dashboard projects. We are um, often in contact with uh, scientists from Ottawa in the development of their own Biomed Open Science dashboard. Um, another dashboard that is, uh, has been inspired by and is currently being developed, uh, inspired by our own dashboard, is the dashboard for the European um, University Hospital Alliance, in which uh, the Charité is just one among many other institutions. And by um, placing them um, next to each other, potentially uh, such a dashboard can be used for uh, benchmarking of um, open science practices. And finally, I would like to thank uh, Gustav and you all for the invitation uh, to be part of this um, seminar. And of course, all our collaborators that have been involved um, in the development of the dashboard and um, helping me in preparing the next version of the update. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Vladislav, for this great presentation. And uh, let's move uh, now straight to the next presentation by Peter Schogode. Please go ahead. Thank you, Vladislav, for this. Uh nice presentation uh, with some more background than I will uh, offer. So that was really good. Uh, yes, as Gustav said, I work as a bibliometric analyst at Karolinska Institute. So I regularly do analysis of the publication output of Karolinska Institute. Uh, we do such things as citation indicators and network analysis, co-publishing uh, between authors, organizations, also subject mappings using, for example, um, medical subject headings or citation clusters. Uh, we also have unpayable data in our system, so we can also do analysis of open access publishing. Uh, but today I will be presenting some work we have done regarding open science practices and measuring thereof. And we have worked with this for last year or so. Um, this work started out when I was contacted by a master student. Um, his name is Manuel Savalis. He had done some analysis of KIA publications, mentioning open data, open code, and a couple of other indicators. And his work uh, received some interest from, from the management at KI. So we started to look into these methods, uh, methods to measure open science practices uh, also called transparency indicators. So I've been mostly like uh, coordinating this work and my colleague Alvin Gavel has, has done most of, of the work in coding.
we have used uh, some software developed at Stanford. Um, uh, the software is made openly available um, by the authors of this, this paper. Um, the software identifies uh, statements mentioning uh, the use of open data, open code, um, pre-registration of, of studies, uh, also conflicts of interest and funding. In this presentation, I will mostly focus on open data and, and open code. The software identifies statements uh, from full text of research publications. So to be able to do this, we need uh, full text of publications. That's kind of new to us in the bibliometric system. We only have metadata as we used to, to work with metadata, but in this case, we needed to work with full text. Um, so we needed also to get information from, from elsewhere than the bibliometric system. Um, so we've been uh, using PubMed Central um, and developed some code so we uh, are able to analyze any set of publications from PubMed Central. Uh, that's only about half of the publications from, from Karolinski Institute. And we've been doing a study uh, for covering the last like six publication years. Um, that's in total more than 30,000 publications, but we have analyzed around 14,000 for which we could get full text from, from PubMed Central. This is a rather large uh, data set regarding, uh, or taking into regard that we, we analyze um, full text. So um, code and software needs to, to be rather efficient. This is uh, the results from, from this analysis. Um, as you can see, most publications have funding statements and conflict of interest statements. Uh, about 20% of the publications mention open data. So they either share their own data or they use data shared openly by others in their analysis. Uh, the methods cannot differentiate between data shared by, by the authors of paper and data shared by others, and only identify that, that the data is openly available, or at least the statement says that the data is openly available. There's some increase during this uh, period, but, but perhaps surprising uh, a little increase um, of, of uh, mentioning this of open data. Pre-registration can be detected in about 10% of the publications. And we find uh, mentioning of, of open code in four to 5% of the publications. I choose to call these results as tentative. Uh, there's a degree of, of uncertainty uh, related to, to the results. Um, here are some of the issues regarding the validity and reliability of, of the methodology. Um, as I said, we only cover about 50% of the publications at KI. So we probably have a bias because we are analyzing open access articles. Uh, I would guess that we overestimate the open science practices by, by only covering this part. Uh, we are only measuring if open data is mentioned. Um, would be very interesting to be able to differentiate between data shared by, by the authors of a paper and if the authors use data shared by, by others. Uh, also, we cannot differentiate between uh, which type of data that is, um, that, uh, is referred to in a paper. So it can be open data that is only a few rows of, of compiled data underlying some table or figure, um, or very large data sets resulting from years of data collection. Um, so we treat uh, those rather different things as, as the same way. And we don't really know how well these, these code captures statements 
uh, it's rather easy to uh, evaluate if a statement that has been captured by code uh, is, is correct, but it's much harder to know uh, if there's statements uh, in the papers that we, we do not capture. So this uncertainty calls for some caution when interpreting uh, results. Here are some examples of data availability statements um, captured from the, the uh, retrieved from the full text. Uh, as you can see, they are pretty different. Uh, some refer to repositories and have persistent identifiers, while others are just uh, a reference to, to a file uh, or a supplementary material of some, some kind. And, and those, the latter ones are probably uh, less likely to fulfill uh, such requirements as, as the FAIR principles. Uh, so we also did some analysis of where data can be found. Uh, so also in this case, we did this for Karolinski Institute only. Uh, we found that most statements refer to repositories. That's about two thirds of the statements. Uh, about one fourth of the statements refer to uh, other kinds of sources, mostly like supplementary materials in different files. Uh, and for some uh, publications, we could not find the source given, at least not in a machine readable way. Which repositories are mentioned by KR researchers? Uh, we see that gene expression omnibus is by far the, the most common one. Uh, we then have GitHub, which is perhaps not a repository. Uh, it's uh, more of a platform for code, but, but um, researchers uh, put data in there as well. We have the gene bank, the protein data bank, and Aero Express. Um, we can also see some of the more uh, multidisciplinary repositories in uh, in this list, the Open Science Framework, Figshare, and, and Sonoda. Uh, so some conclusions. Um, using these methods, we can get some valuable information about, uh, in particular, than open data and open code. Uh, so this helps us monitor open science practices over time. There seem to be no large increase in data uh, and code sharing at, at KI from these results. Uh, this information is valuable for, for future work with open science practices. We also get some knowledge about the used repositories. We do not have much information about repositories used by KI researchers uh now we know a little bit more so that's valuable information for us uh, the results are rather uncertain i would say for several reasons uh, we have this validity problem that cannot differentiate between uh, data or code uh, sharing uh, from the authors of a paper and if they just use open uh, code or or data uh, shared by others and also that cannot differentiate between types of, of data, like raw research data and compiled data, for example. And we have some questions marks uh, regarding how well we capture uh, statements as well. Um, we also have this problem with the coverage of, of publications. Uh, we may be able to solve this problem for KI, but, but that will be uh, quite a lot of work because we don't have a collection of PDFs of all KI publications. We need to gather them somehow, um, and and also probably from from licensed uh, sources. But it would would be harder to do that for for um, other organizations or other universities. We need to be a little bit careful when interpreting the results. Uh, comparisons between uh, universities or between departments should uh, be done with some care. 
there's a risk that we compare apples and oranges. Um, different fields have, have different prerequisites. Uh, also, uh, quantitative and qualitative research have different prerequisites. Um, the next step for, for us now uh, will be to put this into some use, talk to stakeholders within Kolinsky Institute that, um, and uh, people working with, with uh, data management. So that will be interesting uh, to see in the future how this can be used. Um, so I thank you for, for uh, listening and I'm looking forward uh, to any questions. Thank you so much, Peter, for a very interesting presentation. Now, uh, let's move into the discussion. And uh, immediately we have one uh, question from uh, Sana Isabel Ulspare. Uh, please uh, go ahead. Yes, um, I was wondering, oh, let's see, my, my image froze. I was wondering, uh, there was a book released recently called Philosophy of Open Science, written by Sabina Leonelli, where she, where she critiques what she perceives as a growing focus on sharing objects over collaboration, equity, and other values that has long been the goal of open, open science. Uh, so I was wondering how you guys analyze what va values and directions for open science your indicators, measures, and rewards, um, and if there are ways to use metrics to explore patterns and changes besides object sharing patterns and the quantity of shared data and such, uh, for example, changes in collaborative practices. A very broad question. Questions. Yeah, yes, <laughs> but very, um, very relevant in the context of research assessment. Uh, Vladislav and Peter, who would like to uh, give this um, a front? Maybe just really briefly, um, like I mentioned, of course, we are very much constrained by what is feasible uh, in the measurement and monitoring of, of these matrices, um, metrics rather. Um, I, th I would say that in order to uh, yeah, pay attention to what has been overlooked, potentially another uh, Delphi process um, that um, operationalizes how would one go about to um, yeah capture the what have we have been missing so far um, yeah uh, reflected by the consensus of a community of researchers that will be the process that needs to be done in order for this to be addressed currently um, of course we once again we're limited by what we can uh, feasibly measure with with the resources that we have and the sources of data that uh, are available to us. Peter, would you like to add anything? Just something um, is that when we are able to at least measure if, for example, data is shared, we may perhaps also uh, combine that information with other information, uh, for example, uh, collaboration. Uh, so if no, which publications have been uh, using open data? Maybe we can see if if uh, we see differences regarding, for for example, collaboration. Uh, so that's perhaps uh, how this information can be valuable in also looking into other kinds of patterns. We have two more hands and a question in the chat. But while we're on this topic, I'd like to. Uh, come in with a question of my own. So uh, there's uh, a lot of talk about how to improve and reform on research assessment uh, these days. Uh, and uh, there have been many calls for responsible use of metrics and for abandoning uh, certain metrics, in particular the journal impact factor. And uh, I wanted to ask both of you, uh, do you see a future for using these kinds of metrics of open practices in the evaluation of researchers, for example, uh, for promotion or for uh, evaluation of research organizations, like in uh, uh, deciding how much money to send to different departments uh, in a university? Uh, 
can that be done responsibly? And in that case, uh, what what do we need? What further development is needed on what you have shown us today in order that we get there? Do you think? Um, I think one important uh, uh, principle that is often mentioned that is uh, that quantitative data should uh, um, inform more qualitative uh, decisions. And I think that's rather important in this case as well. Uh, we can say that um, a certain proportion of publications uh, are mentioning open data and they are built on open data. Uh, but this, uh, this is a very crude um, measure, uh, but it can be used to, to start discussions and to monitor, um, uh, for example, practices at uh, different departments. Uh, but I think it's uh, very risky to, to uh, turn that into some kind of metrics um, that automatically uh, is used to, to uh, disseminate uh, resources to different departments, for example. Uh, I think the kind of uh, problems uh, that I mentioned regarding the validity and reliability, uh, they are probably too severe to, to uh, use it that, that way. Can they be overcome? Or is this an argument against uh, uh, quantitative uh, indicators overall? No, um, I think different measures have different um, properties and, and, and can be used in, in different uh, ways. Um, I think we have quite a lot of problems uh, with these kind of measures to use them that way, but they inform us uh, and, and makes quality, uh, perhaps, decisions more informed and and also can start a discussion where we can look into more details regarding uh, practices. Thank you. I won't press you anymore on this topic. <laughs> Vladislav, would you like to comment? Yes, uh, just briefly, I absolutely uh, agree that we cannot uh, have such quantitative uh, measures as the yeah future way of um, making decisions on promotions and hiring uh, of scientists. Um, but a profile feasibly can be made uh, on an individual basis, although mostly these practices, as we've seen uh, in these applications, is on an institutional uh, so larger scale. But um, I would say as long as the conversation doesn't stop there, but actually it's a you know first uh, step in a process that then goes deeper and determines why, for example, such a metric uh, is unexpectedly low or unexpectedly high, and then there's um, you know deeper analysis of this rather than just leaving it at a score and then uh, proceeding from there. I think that's uh, absolutely important to to not abuse the metrics like um, other metrics have been met, uh, abused in the past and on an individual um, basis we have uh, at, at quest and at the um, bih uh, ways of incentivizing individual researchers that follow uh, practices in in the form of um, uh, awards so we have criteria and calls for um, you know, authors of articles that fulfill certain criteria, and when they're fulfilled, they are uh, free to apply for an award that they can uh, receive from our institution if their articles really follow um, to our standards the practices that we want to incentivize. Thank you. That's a very interesting approach to incentivization. Now, uh, let's move on with questions from the audience. Uh, Thomas Theresa Kieselbach. Um. Thank you so much. Um, I I would like to ask if you possibly see any perspective that um, the wonderful tools that you are working on help institutions to give support to researchers to create better research and also researchers uh, um, to make better research so that we get better quality of research. 
Is there any perspective of that? Because improving the quality of research is one of the goals um, that we connect with uh, open science. Thank you. We, we haven't like worked with this uh, for for so long, but uh, we we have like the people supporting researchers uh, with the data management. Uh, they don't. We don't really know uh, what kind of repositories are used by by KI researchers. Of course, we have some information, but we don't have very much. We don't have a lot of like structured information about that. Uh, so that's that could be one thing that we can know a little bit more of which data that is used by our researchers, and that's make makes it possible to support researchers uh, with data management. So I think that's kind of an important thing to to do, and and that could be a result of this work. I think that the quality of research is a very general, and of course, um, very hard to define across different fields. Um, and find practices that are applicable. Uh, so one of the lower level, um, or, you know, lower hanging fruits that we are trying to pick is the at least the quality of the reporting of the research. So the quality of the, the articles that are produced. And one um, novel way that we are uh, implementing in trying to help the researchers in that process is to use the tools that we um, develop to help them at the stage of, let's say, submission. So they have prepared manuscript. Uh, ideally, in the future, we envision that at the point of submission, for example, the preprint platform or another a platform, um, the manuscript can be screened by our tools and already um, potential deficiencies can be automatically flagged and alert the authors that, um, for example, you're missing um, a data availability statement, will you please include one? Now, this is also a step in, the, in that direction that is potentially fraught with um, danger. Uh, we, If we do not do this the right way, we can just force um, scientists to uh, yeah, be involved in a box ticking exercise where they do the bare minimum to, you know, fool the tools that they are doing what's supposed to be done, but they're not really doing this in the spirit. Um, I think when we come to that problem, we will have to address it. Of course, we are aware of it and trying to think about it now, but as a very first step, um, yeah, um, we want to alert authors as early as possible to improve the transparency in their reporting of, of their research. Thank you so much. Thank you. Yes, indeed. Uh, we go to the next question from uh, Ayu Devi. Yes, thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, first, uh, for the first presentation, it's really nice, but I'm wondering, uh, are there any trends or patterns perhaps in the dashboard that are noteworthy or it's interesting to 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 alert for example um there have been the significant fluctuation or maybe consistent changes over time maybe related to um changes in policy for example in 2018 of data policies of HGME and my second questions are uh, also related to dashboard uh, how does the dashboard facilitate decision making or action based on the information it provides and their impact? I know you have mentioned about ben uh, it, it, it benefits as benchmarking of open science practice, but I'm curious to know is there a process for responding to these uh, insights? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, I would try to start with the second question first. So um, yes, currently the, the dashboard itself, in order to really um, analyze the impact that it has, one would have to approach it systematically, which is something that we may be planning in the future, but is not uh, currently done. So we can, uh, you know, the, the dashboard is primarily a monitoring tool and it's 
can tell us how things are developing, but uh, assigning causal um, inferences, you know, why is something changing or is it related to a change in policy or this or that, that would have to be addressed in a specific study. We cannot uh, make such conclusions based on this. Yet um, the motivation and the belief is that um, by simply um, making the, the practices transparent and exactly as you, as you mentioned, um, being able to pinpoint uh, interesting developments um, or deficiencies and, and success stories in this, this is, it becomes a useful communication tool um, that it, it, at the very least is a starter for conversations about which practices um, can we focus more on and what can we do uh, uh, about to address them. Um, and yeah, I think generally it's important to, to make a distinction between more classical scientific research um, projects where you have a specific question in mind and then you, um, you research with that question uh, whereas the dashboard is just an overview of many practices over time without necessarily um, a narrative that goes with it uh, other than here's how things change over time. Uh, having said that, if you permit me maybe to briefly uh, pinpoint some interesting developments because you asked for those, I think maybe the, one of the most interesting one is the one down here. Uh, can you see it first of all or? Yes. Yes, all right. So um, during the development, uh, sorry, during the monitoring period for this particular metric, which is the reporting of summary results, um, you see an incredible change in behavior um, in reporting. So it used to be very, very low, you know, under 5%. Now it's nearly at 100%. And it's basically, I think, at the next uh, update round, it will be. Um, approaching nearly 100%. Um, I think having seen such an incredible change is um, helpful in the sense that it shows you that behavior can change, that it's not all a lost cause, and that um, you can then look at what exactly happened, try to find you know, the, the reasons that uh, this behavior uh, was, change was achieved, and um, try to, you know, replicate this in, in other cases. But um, yeah, I think part of it was exactly uh, the initial observation that um, something that we want, you know, to, to be better was at a really abysmally low rate. Then this starts a conversation about how, what can we do to change this? How can we make the line go up in a very simple sense? And then you over time see whether things are developing in the direction that you want and whether more advocacy or um, interactions, you know, with um, people in the institution that could potentially uh, achieve the change are needed. So in, in that sense, I think, yeah, but generally speaking, all of the open science practices are showing an increase at the very least, maybe not always as fast as we want to, but through time, there is a general improvement, which is um, encouraging. Okay, I'll, I'll stop sharing again. Thank you. Thanks. Yes, that is a, a very interesting uh, point indeed of a, a, a huge improvement uh, in uh, reporting of clinical trials results in the registry. Uh, next question is from Marco Schirone. Yes, thank you so much for the, the presentation and the great presentation. I just uh, I have a thought and a question. Um, basically, in the medical field, we have, you know, probably the uh, a symptom, all right, it's quite easy, uh, understandable that the, the, the term data is too broad. We have different things that we call data. So we should call, we should say, okay, data of type one or type two, two and so on. For instance, if we have a, like a data bank of proteins. Uh, don't make me talk about uh, medical stuff because that's not my field, but something like that is very, or uh, something that is not connected to sensitive subjects. And we, you have, for instance, uh, interviews data about uh, the experience, the lived experience of patients and so on that are uh, not so easily shareable. So don't you think that it, it could be useful to maybe 
move forward from the idea of data as like one one uh, one concept or one 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 term and start differentiating for instance in in that case i go back to the quantitative analysis of data if for instance we we call data of type 1 this more potentially shareable data then you can analyze more easily the departments that are of, of course are not are working with that kind of data but of course if you call data you, you, the same thing you know everything is data you will be penalizing departments that work more with the phenomenological studies with interviews and so on so that's uh it's an interesting uh, field of uh, analysis uh, yes and to peter maybe uh, uh, there would be a way to extract this kind of information about potentially shareable data uh, or not not easily shareable data from the the full text probably i don't know if all this it, it would be like impossible to to do that uh, quite easily from uh, the script you have used but great great uh, presentations yes yeah, as, as i i um mentioned in the presentation like uh, being able to uh categorize uh the the different kinds of, of data would be valuable um and that would give like more uh, detailed information about what what kind of data that that is actually shared uh, and i think that would be be very valuable when when working with uh, research data and, and management thereof just want to point out uh the first link that i posted here the osf preprint is um our attempt of opera operationalization of what open data what does open data mean in our context and uh, so that's in in practice in, as you said you know it's it's hard to define but um you need to be able to to recognize it when you see it and incentivize the right um, instances of it and this is our attempt to to make this uh, as clear as possible um, there are tools though that um, do try to address this more directly by classifying the types of um, research outputs um, that potentially can generate data into the different types of uh, of data so that there are um, attempts to um to have a yeah clear structure there as well all right thank you for that and the floor is open uh for uh questions uh i have uh, one question uh, that i would like to post to both of you which is if if you could uh, um dream freely what uh, what kind of information system or uh, data sources would be ideal um so if you were let's say that you were appointed chief information officer of the university tomorrow uh, what kind of um, of databases or uh, research information systems would you want to put in place uh, in order to uh, make it possible to have a highly comprehensive and valid follow-up of open science practices i think uh, a local solution even if it's ideal is is not enough <laughs> the problem is uh lack of standardization and the, the sad fact that the pdf is still the most common uh format that a scientific article exists in um, and even the xml which is of course uh, much more useful uh, is also non-standardized between the different um, journals and publishers um, therefore specific parsers for specific um, scientific um, articles from different sources are necessary which um, you know creates our job maybe i shouldn't <laughs> I shouldn't be railing against things that, that make me necessary, but um, uh, this would be something that will tremendously help if 
uh, the scientific community agreed on using machine readable formats for um, for their um, outputs. That that's a that's a big one for sure. And of course, the quality of the metadata in the existing databases is not always ideal, especially when it comes to the adoption of um, orchids. Uh, we're not uh, quite far and the uh, raw IDs for the institutions. So, so the, a common problem in this whole process is the um, making sure that we are getting the scientific outputs of the right institution, which in theory could be trivial, but in practice isn't anywhere uh, near so. And then also the determination of which um, authors um, we're, we're talking about because that, that yes, the adoption of the of the orchid isn't um, complete yet. I very much agree with uh, Radislav uh, that we need like would be good be with more structured data, uh, machine readable data. Uh, but I also would like to add open data, so open um, metadata and, and open full text. Uh, data because that would make it possible also to uh, collaborate more. Uh, we are hindered uh, very often that we we have these licensed data they can't share with others. We uh, it's hard to then also share a code for um, they. If you if you want to process data, you also need the, the structure, and if you can't share the data and the structure and everything, it's also hard to to collaborate regarding. Um, analysis code. Uh, so um, open data on a, on a more global uh, level rather than a, a local like repository. Uh, that would, uh, I think, that could lead to, to um, also better possibilities to analyze, um, for example, open, open science practices. Great, thank you both. We have two more questions for the last minute. So uh, now I would uh, encourage uh, briefer uh, questions and answers in order to make sure that we can fit both in. Uh, Daniel Gunnarsson. Yes, it, it's not a question. It, it's more like an answer or suggestions from, from your questions before. And, and if I had the possibility, I would like to have it, uh, since I'm sitting as a librarian, I do a lot of registration from uh, uh, scholarly articles in uh, device we have here in Sweden. I would really want that when you send in your submission for articles, you have metadata fields for research data, because then you would skip the data mining process and you have that information. So you could register, for instance, in diva or another system where you can put what kind of data you have author you have orchid you have all those kind of information directly and can just register them instead that would be very easy and convenient and we should have perfect control since uh, the publishing of article is so important still more important than research data still today that's all thank you does any of our speakers want to comment on this comment all right, then let's move to the uh, last question from Sana Isabel of Sparre. Yes, uh, it's related, actually. Uh, I was thinking uh, with publications, uh, articles, for example, they are published and then they are done. But with the data re reusability is an important point. Uh, do you see any uh, limitations or possibilities to follow the reusability of data over time as well? Is there metadata available to do that, or is it still in the works? Uh, yes, in fact, the FAIR dashboard that I was very, uh, very briefly showing you uh, goes along that um, that line, uh, which is, uh, you know, the, the FAIR principles includes reusability as the actually the hardest one, the one that is uh, also least likely to be uh, followed, and we um, we are trying to monitor that and there are tools that assess um, data um, yeah da data objects for the fair criteria yes uh, I might want to reframe my question is there any way to follow if data is reused like this data has been reused in several articles last 
years in yes. another the, 10 years yes C currently uh they are different than patch uh yeah patchwork like methods for this we are thinking about it and we in fact are incentivizing data being reused as one of the criteria and hope that authors whose data have been reused therefore will alert us to this and receive their well um earned um money so uh, this is an, uh, something exactly that we want to incentivize and then in the process also um develop ways of um following thank you thanks peter would you like to have any last words i can perhaps just add that uh that's something uh, like data citations or data uh, statements could be something that we could perhaps capture with these uh, methods and that's one kind of, of uh, reuse of, of, of these data. We can at least know if some publication is mentioning the data. All right. Uh, we are almost at the end of our time. And I would like to thank both of our speakers, uh, Vladislav and Peter, for their great uh, contributions. Uh, for me, it feels like we have seen a glimpse uh, of the future. Certainly, there will be more monitoring of open science practices uh, in some form uh, going forward. So uh, thank you, Vladislav and Peter. And thank you, everyone who joined today. <laughs>